So I'm here to try and tell you um, how to build a quantum true random number generator in the next 20 minutes. Um, so you're going to have to forgive me for speaking quickly. Now before we begin, we have to start with a description of what true randomness is. And the take home lesson is that true random data is unpredictable. And what this means is that if you have any amount of true random data, an arbitrary amount of processing power and time, and perfect knowledge of how it was generated, you cannot predict the next bit with better than chance. Uh, and to meet this gold standard, your data has to be unbiased and not produced by an algorithm. And most of you probably know that computers use algorithms to generate pseudo random numbers. Uh, but what some of you might not know <coughs> is that even numbers that you generate in your head do not meet the standard. Uh, these numbers are interesting because they're useful for cryptography, scientific, ap scientific applications, and drinking games. So if you wanted random numbers, you have two basic approaches you can take. You can use a pseudo-random number generator, which uses an initial secret starting condition and an algorithm to generate a deterministic sequence of numbers, which is considered for most applications a good enough approximation to the random distribution to be used for many uh, purposes. Or you can use a true random number generator, uh, which it's almost wrong to say that they generate random numbers. What they really do is they sample random numbers um, by taking a chaotic physical system and measuring variation in that system and then using that to generate the numbers. Um, no matter what you do, it is very easy to make a mistake in your design and very hard to find it. So you have to always doubt yourself at every step. Now, among true random number generators, there are two sorts. And I'm going to start by describing non-quantum true random number generators. These sample a complex uh, and chaotic system. I, I use chaos and entropy in interchangeably. Um, and use that measured um, entropy to generate random numbers. Now, these are not that hard to design if you think very carefully. Uh, for instance, you can use minor differences in, in user input timing. Uh, you can sample air pressure or temperature over very small time scales. Um, but fundamentally, what you're doing is you're sampling a system that has a lot of inputs. And you have to ask yourself whether the complexity of the output is the same thing or as good as random output. Because since you have many outputs, uh, sorry, many inputs, it's very difficult to prove that what all of them are, let alone whether um, some of them are defined by an algorithm or biased in some way. And if you have a quantum true random number generator, the main difference is that you've sampled a very simple system of high entropy, such as the behavior of single particles or photons. Um, now this is interesting because for specifically for a sealed radioactive source because it has no inputs and still has outputs. And that's great because it makes it very difficult to attack. Um, now, these type of sources, you typically end up with low bandwidth because you don't like dealing with things that emit a lot of radiation. Um, and um, it's also very difficult to detect subatomic particles or single photons using equipment that you have around your house. Uh, however, if you overcome these obstacles, the output should be truly random. And I say should because there's a lot of mistakes you might make. And I'm going to go over a couple of these. Uh, the first most tempting mistake to make is to use more than one detector for your entropy source and have one of the detectors output zeros and the other one output ones. Um, now, on paper this is nice, but in practice, the detection efficiency of your detectors and where they are located relative to the source will make it such that one of them is going to be more likely to detect things than the other. Um, so you will have some sort of bias involved. Um, and the person who came up with this method also described a correct method of doing that, I should just say, because his paper was very nice. Um, the second mistake to make, which is probably worse, is to use a counter uh, on, on some microcontroller or computer and then use the particle detector, or a particle detector, I should say, as a CPU interrupt, and then it outputs whatever number the counter is at. Now, the problem with that is that when you deal with particle detection statistics, the time between uh, detections is defined not by a random distribution, by a, by, but by a Poisson distribution. And this means that there's some average value between, average value of time between the particle detection events, which is more likely than other times. So the numbers you output, the difference between them is defined by a Poisson distribution, which is very bad. Um, 
Now, the last thing you should not try to do is try to calculate the expected time between particle uh, detection events because it's going to vary over time and you don't know exactly how many atoms there are and you don't know your detector efficiency with absolute precision. So not only will you have a bias, you will no longer know what it is. Uh, now, our design doesn't have that many groundbreaking developments. It has two things which are very convenient, however. It has a solid state particle detector, so it lets you use sane voltages. Uh, like it's much easier to deal with in vacuum tubes, um, like Geiger Muller tubes, I should say. And secondly, it has a dedicated microcontroller that does the sampling. So you don't have to worry about complex timing issues in a multitasking operating system you might connect this to. So you can just plug it in, sample it, and it works fine. Uh, this is a circuit diagram which you may not be able to see very well. Um, basically, the first part to the left is the primary detector circuit, where you which I'll describe more later. It has to be enclosed in a Faraday cage to, um, to block out external noise, which would completely drown out the signal otherwise. Uh, then you have two more operational amplifiers that make the signal a usable voltage. There is a potentiometer that compensates for uh, DC bias. However, this is a bad design decision and I regret doing it. Uh, however, it does work. Uh, finally, you have pulse, shape, pulse shaping and sampling stages afterwards. Now, the circuits I made out of Flex PCB because it's great for rapid prototyping, and I've included here a, a couple of nice pictures of some, some boards just because they, uh, they're very pretty. Um, now, the core of the particle detector is a pin photodiode, and this is like a small solar panel. If you apply something of enough energy to one end, you knock loose a few electrons, and you can detect this as a voltage difference between the two ends. So you use a differential, uh, what's called a trans impedance amplifier, um, which is basically an op amp, to amplify that difference to a usable signal, which you can see as an oscilloscope's trace on the screen. You have a spike and then a logarithmic decay. There we go. Afterwards, when you have this at a usable voltage, you do a little bit of pulse shaping to make it easier to sample. And for this, I just use a Schmidt trigger hex inverter. So you see that when there's a spike, which would be hard for the microcontroller to catch, it translates into a bit bigger logic pulse. Uh, and I have a nicer, this is what it looks like uh, on a bigger sample. It's very pretty. Um, now, the sampling algorithm is where things get, you have to pay more attention. Um, basically, what it does here is it measures the time between two particle detection events. And then it does that again. So you have two times between particle detection events and you compare them together. And if the first time is larger, you output a one. If the second time is larger, you output a zero. I didn't come up with this myself. Several other people have done this before. It works very well. And the reason is the time between particle detection events is defined by a Poisson distribution. But the time between two particle det detection events have a very, very similar Poisson distribution. So you can compare the two to get a nice random distribution. Uh, the demonstration won't be happening because the microcontroller died on its uh, journey here. However, if you'd like to play with the detector later, that will be possible. Um, now, once you have output, you need to analyze it. Otherwise, you might find out that it's meaningless. And you start by creating basic frequency charts to make sure you have no missing numbers. And uh, you can also try to recreate the binomial distribution by um, plotting the frequency of averages of sets of numbers. Uh, and while doing these things, you have to keep in mind that proving randomness is impossible using traditional hypothesis testing statistics. What you're really doing is looking for problems that you expect to have and then fixing them if they come up. This is a frequency chart for 60, 000, the first 60,000 random uh, numbers generated with the, uh, with the generator. And we didn't see anything unexpected. Uh, then I took 10,000 means of six digits and graphed them and we get the bino approximately the binomial distribution. Um, so everything seems to be working fine with terms, in terms of simple distributional, uh, distributional problems. Uh, so we I subjected it to a more advanced analysis using the NIST uh, test suite 2.0, which is very nice and well documented uh, and easy to use, I should add. And I subjected 100 megabits of random number generator output to these tests with an alpha value of 0 0.01, which we'll get to later. Um, although I couldn't get the last test working, the 188th test, so I just sort of ignored that. Now, the thing about alpha values is when you're talking about hypothesis testing statistics, it's the chance of random data uh, Hmm, let me start that one over. 
because it's an important point. Uh, if you have an alpha value of 0 0.01, it means there's a 1% chance of, um, in this case, true random da data failing that particular test for non-randomness. And so you actually have an expected failure rate for random data. And um, so given 187 tests run 100 times on one megabit each, we expect 187 failures, and we observe 205, which is not a significantly different number. So things seem to be okay on that point. But much more importantly, the failures didn't cluster on any specific test. So there seems to be no specific problem with the <sighs> output as, me as measured by this test suite. Um, now, I was originally going to talk about this a bit more, but I only found out recently that the people from NIST are actually just down the hall and they have a really cool system that's a bit better than this. Um, and if you haven't seen it yet, you, you must go. It's really neat. Um, however, I still think there's a possibility for hobbyists to build a quantum true random number generator based on single, fo single photon detection using uh, photomultiplier tubes, which unfortunately are vacuum tubes. So they, well, okay, slash fortunately if you like that sort of thing. Um, but uh, it requires high voltages and some tricky electronics. But you should be able to detect single photons with an efficiency of about 30% if you choose your tube care uh, carefully. Um, and uh, other advantages are that you can increase the bandwidth drastically. The bandwidth of the device I built, if you tune it well, is about 75 bytes per second. The one they have in the room a couple down, a uh, couple, uh, couple of doors down is 6.2 orders of magnitude faster. So this is a very attractive method. Uh, it's, it's more expensive though. <laughs> All right. Well, finally, I'd like to thank, uh, I'm from Fulab, the Montreal hackerspace, and I'd like to thank them for providing a, uh, a space to uh, work in and friends to work with. And finally, my friend there, FX, who helped me uh, design a driver for the true random number generator, as well as some data management scripts that saved me many hours of work. Uh, if you want to make one of these yourself, uh, I'm trying to make a board that uh, is suited to experimenting with this sort of thing. I'm going to try to make it available at, or at least information about it available at this website within about a month. Uh, yeah, it is blue on black. That's very unfortunate. I thought it would look better. It doesn't. Uh, it should say legionheavyindustries.com. But uh, the presentation is available for download. Uh, my references are similarly difficult to see, but they're very interesting and you should go check them out because they'll provide literally minutes of entertainment. Uh, specifically, the photodiode data sheet is, uh, is particularly interesting. Thank you very much. Uh, and for the... Okay. And for the remainder of the time left, I'll uh, field any questions until they kick me out. No, yes, over there. Oops, can you speak up just a little bit? Mm, are you asking whether... I can't quite... Uh, can you speak up a bit more? Sorry. Yeah. Uh, he's asking whether when detecting single photons you would have problems with uh, electronic interference from nearby devices. And yes, you would. Uh, but you actually have even more complicated problems when you deal with detecting single photons because there's a background noise which you can't eliminate, um, which I don't understand very well. Um, but you, at the very least, you'd have to build everything in a Faraday cage again. Oh, yes, over there. Oh, okay. I thought somebody might ask that. Um, would you like to guess? Okay, it's the americium 241 from a smoke detector. Yeah, it's, yeah. No special license required. Uh, yes, over there. Oh, thank you. Uh, do we have any other questions? Okay. Well, if anybody would like to join me to uh, play with the particle detector, which, which does work, um, I will meet you outside this room and we'll find somewhere we can sit down. I brought my oscilloscope and you can see what the output looks like. Oh, uh, the NIST one? Uh, it's on your map. Good. Excellent.